I am 27 and working my dream job, a daily newspaper reporter in my hometown. I am engaged to marry my college boyfriend of five years, and he has just graduated with a master's degree in computer engineering. He's been offered a lucrative job managing a team in Tempe, Arizona. It is a great opportunity for him. <laughs> and allegedly for us. Nonetheless, I start secretly, obsessively researching things like teaching English in a second language overseas, NGO volunteer programs and cruise ship job postings. This is not a conscious choice, but a visceral one. I ended up accepting a scholarship from Rotary International to study in Edinburgh, Scotland. I didn't tell anyone about it for a month. Eventually, I worked up the courage to tell my fiance. I thought you were applying to the newspaper in Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> You're going to Scotland? I didn't have the heart to tell him that of all the applications I sent out, and I sent out a lot, none were to the newspaper in Scottsdale. <laughs> 10 months later, I was flying to Edinburgh with my brand new passport and without my engagement ring. Leaving Las Vegas was the biggest transition of my life. I'd never traveled alone or left the country. I went from spending my days as a general assignment reporter driving a powder blue 1981 Camaro around Las Vegas to life walking around Scotland, studying philosophy and making friends named Alistair, Callum, and Maisie? many of whom were related to nobility at a centuries-old institution. The University of Edinburgh was founded in 1582. For context, that is the year that time jumped ahead not one hour, but 10 days, when Pope Gregory XIII tweaked the 12-month calendar and created the version that we use today. It was the year when January the 1st became New Year's Day. Before that, it was in April. I'll let you Google that. <laughs> Living in Edinburgh was like entering another dimension of space and time. It might as well have been a different planet compared to Las Vegas. <laughs> but a few things were familiar. I found the misfits and the geeks in the student-run theater program. Yeah. It's a decent program, but I was the only American in their midst. And at 27, I was also the oldest member of the group. I have always looked younger than the age on my driver's license, but it was less impressive when I was actually younger. My Edinburgh friends didn't tell me how good I looked for my age. No one says that in your 20s, especially when you're talking to 19-year-olds. <laughs> Instead, they reassuringly said things like, holy shite, 27, that's ancient. <laughs> there was no denying it. This was the 1980s and I was staring down 30 surrounded by teenagers. By 27, I'm sure they all expected to be in proper jobs, like the one that I had fled. Many would be married or planning married. Some would be parents. I was a very strange American to my new Scottish friends. I thought all you guys were, all, were workaholics, they'd say. Otherwise, I settled into college life as a theater nerd surprisingly well. I was cast in four productions, and one of those was for the Fringe. The Edinburgh Fringe is the largest performing arts festival in the world. Even though a lot of it isn't very good. 
Our student production was held in a 200-seat Bedlam Theater, a distinguished but barely renovated neo-Gothic church near the city's center. At the time, I was five months into my year-long study abroad program. Or I should say I was about five months into my escape. Before I left, my fiance had been looking at various configurations of beige tract housing with desert rock landscaping. It made sense. We'd have a family one day, so we'd need at least three bedrooms and a safe suburban block, maybe a cul-de-sac. But I thought the neutral-hued stately homes looked like the kind you see in the news broadcast, you know, wrapped in yellow police caution tape. <laughs> the sight of a gruesome murder-suicide. I wasn't feeling homicidal, but I hadn't yet been carried across the threshold of a stucco-clad Stepford home. In Scotland, I was not just uncoupled, but blissfully unencumbered. I didn't even have the demands of frequent reality treks. This was pre-cell phone times. So calling home required purchasing a phone card from a convenience store and dialing many digits and access codes. <laughs> I didn't do it often. Communing with the theater geeks 5,000 miles from the real world was exactly what I needed. Inhabiting personas, any persona that was not my own, gave me immense joy. It wasn't that I didn't want to grow up. I mean, no one wants to do that. <laughs> I didn't want to start the inevitable downward slide into predictability, conformity, and death just yet. The newsroom in Las Vegas had been like a crystal ball. I saw a shocking future. I worked with a resigned lot of clever and talented adrenaline junkies who were surprisingly passive about their own lives. Most were heavy drinkers with failed marriages and everything about them seemed drab, devoid of color. We joked and laughed, but no one seemed particularly happy. It made me question my own cap happiness and my own passiveness. Was I choosing? Or was I being chosen? When my boyfriend said, I don't just want you to come to Arizona with me, I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? My eyes went wide and my mouth dry. Are you sure? <laughs> he was smiling and adamant and waiting for the typical <gasps> answer. I said, yes, of course. Mm -mm. <laughs> Cliffhanger. I said, yes, of course. I wasn't brave enough to tell him no. I loved him, but I was not ready for a white picket fence life with a basketball hoop on the garage. I was ready to join a sketch comedy show halfway around the world. <laughs> set on the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> that was the production that they chose for Fringe. I don't know what inspired them to choose such an American theme, but I will tell you that no one laughed when I said, ha, I guess no one's gonna make fun of Scotty's accent now. <laughs> she gonna take it more, Captain. I'm giving her what she's got.
a theater elder from Glasgow, who was probably only around 22, raised an eyebrow and told me that they'd be handling the jokes. Thank you very much. <laughs> My input was not needed. This production was the crowning jewel of the academic theater season and authorship was a coveted honor. They must have pulled an all-nighter because a day later we had scripts. I wasn't in many scenes and in most I was just window dressing. It will come as no surprise that I was cast as Uhura, the polyglot communications officer <laughs> in a mini skirt. I was the only black person <laughs> in the theater group and one of scant few at the university. I wonder how long they had dreamed of doing a Star Trek program. <laughs> but thought, you know, we can't pull this off without a dashing charismatic captain, a slim dark haired Spock and a black girl. Looking back, it is flattering <laughs> that they chose something that intentionally included me. But at the time, the race-based casting left me with a sense of unease. That unease grew when they gave us a rundown of what would be my final scene. Uhura was old, past her prime. Kirk wanted a new conquest. The crew hatched a scheme to trade me in for a hot young Martian, something that the horny Captain Kirk was very keen on. The young, sexy alien would come aboard for a tour and they would devise a hasty swap. I would be teleported away despite my presumably hilarious protestations. This is the first time I thought of myself of being old. These kids looked at me and what did they see? Not a peer, but a failed adult. Indeed, months later I would return home to Las Vegas unemployed and sleeping in my childhood bed. By then, my ex-fiance would be living in one of those Arizona homes he'd showed me. He would already be expecting his first child, a girl. In the years to follow, I would have 11 jobs and live in 16 different addresses, spanning the country from North Carolina to Northern California. These kids didn't want to be me. I mean, most of them were majoring in theater, so the odds of them actually being me in 10 years were really high. <laughs> yes. But at the time, their aspirations were, were, were um, higher. <laughs> they didn't think that they would be in a musty theater that smelled of stale popcorn and mildew when they were 27. They wouldn't be going halvesies on a pint at lunch. They would have respectable friends, respectable work, respectable lives. I didn't have to worry about grades or preparing for a future, so I was experimental with my time at the university. That's what led me to the command deck of the USS Enterprise, a, makesh a makeshift console desk on a creaky wooden stage adorned with cardboard screen and fake buttons. And for reasons that no one cared to explain to me, there was no Scotty in engineering. <laughs> I don't remember laughing much during rehearsals. Well, you know, not real laughs. I did a lot of encouraging laughs in the way that your friends laugh when you invite them to your improv shows. <laughs> After Fringe, I went on to play a singer who was a not so merry murderess. She was ironic, ironically on trial for killing her husband. I don't know if they lived in a stucco home. 
being away from what I thought was expected of me, married and living in a Mech mansion, making suburban mom friends in Tempe, Arizona, was a gift that shaped the rest of my life, for better and for worse. During my time in Scotland, I went to a spa in Hungary, played pool in Prague, ate mussels in Brussels, slept on a wall in a plaza in Sevilla, and rode a bike through tulips in Amsterdam. I turned getting lost, missing the bus, and taking the wrong train into a goddamn art form. A friend asked me what I would have done if my fiance had said, go to Scotland, live it up, and I'll see you in a year. We'll never know but I strongly suspect I wouldn't have enjoyed the year as much. It's the difference between the feeling of hitting the snooze on your alarm before work and hitting the snooze and remembering it's a holiday. <laughs> I hate that I ran away. I hate that I thought I needed an excuse to not move to Tempe, Arizona? <laughs> but desperation is a great motivator, and panic revealed an inner strength and ingenuity that I didn't know I was capable of. It was messy, and I am filled with apology, but not regret. Someone else's great opportunity is not worth your misery. And I'd argue that a life you wholeheartedly choose for richer or for poor in a Southwest cul-de-sac or a North Park rental <laughs> is better than a life chosen for you. That was the inimitable Deborah Bass.